starting a new school or university, moving to a new city or a new country, starting a new job, becoming a new parent, becoming a parent of a teenager, anyone in the house who's just had a teenager come into the house, becoming an empty nester, losing a loved one, facing a health challenge, navigating a relationship breakdown, struggling with our mental health, seeing the unrest in our world today. Life is full of challenges and season changes. Can I see a nod if this resonates with anyone here? We've been exploring this idea of season change during our prayer week this past week, and perhaps you are personally facing a season change right now. As a Springwood family with a new pastoral and leadership team, we are collectively on a journey of season change. As we navigate the future, and as we reimagine what it looks like to be the church in this new world post COVID. And on a global scale, we are witnessing the chaos and the craziness in the world around us. These times can bring a sense of uncertainty, a sense of instability, perhaps even fear and anxiety. And that's normal. It's normal to feel those things with everything that is happening around us. But what does it look like? What does it look like to be a Christ-loving, spirit-led, hope-filled community? These words might be familiar. We see them on the foyer every time we walk through these doors. But how do we be all of this amidst the chaos? Maybe that looks like some of our bedrooms there. These three declarations, they seem completely countercultural to the world that we are living in. So how do we move from aspirational words, beautifully painted on a wall, to a lived experience? How do we as a community respond to this radical call on our lives as a church and individually in these uncertain times? Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be with you here today. If you are here for the first time, so glad that you are here. And if you have been journeying with us for many years now, we're also glad that you are here. My name is Alina, and I'm so privileged to be one of your new pastors on this team. And I'd love to take us on a journey this morning as we seek to answer this question of how we be all that God is calling us to be. And where I'm going to take us this morning at first may seem a little bit obscure, but there's something that we can actually learn here. And I'm going to invite you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And there's an incredible story here in this book. It's in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And it may actually give us some direction to the questions that we find ourselves asking at this time. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I'm going to unpack the story a little bit, and then there's a key verse in verse 12 that I'm going to focus on. So Jehoshaphat, it's a beautiful name, was the king of Judah at the time. He was king as his son, and he was a good and faithful king. He followed God. He walked with him, unlike his dad, who in his later years of life actually turned away from God. And so one day, this king, this good and faithful king, actually receives word that his enemies have declared war on him. Three enemies had joined forces and were now advancing towards him. Can you imagine hearing this news? All of your enemies have come together and now they're declaring war on you and they are coming at you. And so Jehoshaphat pleaded for God's guidance. Then he gathered the families of Judah together in assembly and together they cried out to God for help because it seemed like an impossible situation. The enemies were coming fast. Their future was uncertain. But then God intervened in a miraculous way. 
As Jehoshaphat's army was advancing towards the enemy, they started singing. Can you imagine singing at a time like that? And at the time that they were singing, somehow, some way, these enemies turned against each other and ended up taking each other out, and Judah's army won the victory. It's an incredible story, and it gives us hope, it gives us assurance when we think about the fact that the battles that we face in life are not our battles, but our God's. However, there's something I actually want to draw our attention to this morning that we may have missed, and it's what happened before the battle. It's what Jehoshaphat did before he moved in towards the enemy. What he did in that moment displayed courage, boldness, and vulnerability. And this is the verse that I want to turn our attention to this morning. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12. This is what he said, Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that's about to attack us. We don't know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. We've got no idea. We've got no plan, no strategy. We're not sure, but our eyes are on you. Instead of offering a stirring vision of hope For the future, to inspire the people to venture forth, Jehoshaphat said he didn't know, but he pointed people to God. And in doing so, I believe that Jehoshaphat actually demonstrates for us what we as a community, what we as individuals need to do in these uncertain times. As a church, may we come together to look not to an unknown future, but to a known God who will strengthen us, who will encourage us, who will give us all that we need for the days ahead so that we can remain tethered in him among the chaos. You know, historians of early church history, they tell us that that early church, it grew so rapidly during times of difficulty because they literally came together and looked to God And over the coming weeks, we're going to be unpacking this a little bit more for the month of March. There's chaos around us, as I described earlier, and yet we can remain tethered, anchored, secure in God and his calling for our lives. A secure connection can make all the difference, right? A secure Wi-Fi connection can make all the difference. And Martin and I discovered this just a few weeks ago when we were down at Converge Young Adults Camp. Is there a few people here that went down to Converge? Some of our young adults? Yes, I can see a few of you. So we're down there at this beautiful place. If you've been there, it's Stewart's Point on the beach. Amazing facility, amazing place. We had a great time together. Except for one thing, our car battery was flat and our super high-tech electronic vehicle locked us out of the car halfway through the camp. Like, the, ca- the car was so dead that we couldn't even use the electronic opening mechanism to open the car. We couldn't even pop the bonnet to jumpstart the car to get the car going again. It was this secure metal box that we could not get into, and it was a keyless entry, so there was absolutely no way in. It was midnight, All of our belongings were in the car. Everything we needed was in this secure metal box. And I have to admit that I was starting to get a little bit anxious at this point. Until we realised that amidst the dodgy reception that is Stuart's campground, we were able to get an internet connection. And so what did we do? We did what anyone does when you're in a situation that you don't know what to do. You Google it, right? So we Googled, how do you get into a Mazda 3 that is a keyless entry and you can't get into your car because the battery's flat? Well, it turns out, ladies and gentlemen, and there's probably Mazda owners that knew this, and I feel a little bit silly that I hadn't done my homework, there's a secret key in your little electronic thingy. And there's also a secret key hole that you can put the secret key in, but you have to pull the handle out, look underneath, and somehow find it. This is what I learnt by looking on Google. And somehow, someway, after 30 minutes of wrestling to get into this car, we found our way in. It makes a difference when you're connected. 
It makes a difference when you are tethered. And in the uncertainty of our times, in this new journey that we are embarking on as a church, the challenges that we are facing personally, church, let us come together and look to God. Let us remain connected. Let us remain tethered amidst the chaos. Let us be who we are called to be as a Springwood community, a Christ-loving, spirit-led, hope-filled church. And we are called to connect. That's what we're talking about today. We're called to grow. We are called to go. And we're called to testify, to share what God is doing in our lives. And this morning we're going to unpack, as we've heard from ChatGBT, a little bit about community, a bit about what it means to connect, to experience a true sense of belonging. At this point in my journey, I was surrounded by people. There were people everywhere. I was connecting with my students and staff on a regular basis. I had a housemate. I, we invited people over a lot. I had family and friends around that cared about me. And yet, in the midst of all this, I felt lonely. It was my second year in ministry, and I was loving my job at BAC. I think we've got a few BAC students and staff in the house. I loved my time there. I'd moved back from Avondale, back to Brizzy. It was a place where I was well-connected. I knew people. I had a network that I had established over the past 10 years, and yet in this season, I felt lonely. At this point in my life, I was a single young adult, and most of my friends were married with kids. And that's a beautiful season to be in, but when you're in a different season, for me, I really struggled. I felt like we didn't connect anymore. I felt like we didn't have anything in common. And at this time, I wasn't really sure where I fit at church either. At school, I was Pastor Alina, and I I knew what that meant. But then when I came to church, I wasn't sure, was I still Pastor Alina, or could I just be Alina? Could I take the pastor hat off? Uh, Who were my people? Who could I connect with? And I was in that funny space where I wasn't really a teen, a youth anymore. I wasn't an older adult. I was in that funny, weird, grey zone in between, a young adult trying to figure out my life. And then there was that awkward moment that would happen without fail when I would visit a new church. I would have just finished preaching, I'd be at the door, greeting people, shaking hands, and without doubt, someone would say to me, now, are you married? And of course, I would say, no, I wasn't. And then they would want to unpack all the possible reasons, maybe why I wasn't married, and offer some very helpful advice on how I could get married, including introducing me to their grandchildren or son or whoever they were speaking about, their nephew. It was really very kind and generous, but it was so awkward. I used to dread it. I'd kind of want to shoot out the back and not talk to anyone. There were Friday nights when I found I just didn't know what to do with myself. I don't know if you've ever been in that space on a Friday night. I'd loved Friday nights growing up. Uh, It was full of family time and pathfinders and youth group, and there was always something happening. I loved Friday nights. And then when I moved to Brizzy from the sunny coast, there was our uni student group and our young adult group, and there was amazing things happening, and I felt a sense of community. But at this point in my life, all those years later, I didn't know where I belonged. I didn't know what to do on a Friday night. Where do I belong? You may not relate to my struggle of being a single female pastor, but I'm sure you can identify with that feeling of being alone, of feeling lonely. The search for belonging, this need we have for connection, it's one of society's epic struggles of being human. We all battle with it. Physician and researcher Dean Ormish observes that the need for connection and for community is primal. It's as fundamental as the need for air, for water, for food. But the reality is that in our over-connected society, our over-networked society, people are incredibly disconnected. They are lonely and they are desperately searching for a sense of belonging. Researchers have found that loneliness, which can be described as the distress someone feels when their social connections 
don't meet their need for emotional intimacy. Loneliness can have the same impact on our life expectancy as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And they have found that Gen Z, that's our young adults in the house that are 18 to 24, this generation is being described as the loneliest generation on the planet. Everyone's struggling with this. It's in such a global crisis that we are finding that world leaders are actually scrambling and trying to find solutions. Universities in the USA have hired directors of belonging, people who are specifically hired to look after this problem. In the UK, there's even been recommendations that we have a minister of loneliness. The world is trying to find answers and solutions to this problem. And the truth is that loneliness is just as real inside here. It's not just out there. And as I shared earlier, I've had this experience firsthand. And I wonder, and I'm so sorry if this has been you, but I wonder if you've ever walked through the doors of a church and wondered, where do I belong? Or worse, do I actually belong here? Is this a place where I can feel connected? According to research conducted by Susan Meats, um, she connected with the Barna Group, it's a Christian research organisation, found that one in five practising Christians, people who go to church on the regular, feel lonely each day. And so in this culture of loneliness, both inside and outside of our church, this struggle for belonging, it's real. And sometimes we want to belong so badly that we will go to extreme lengths to feel like we belong. And there's some interesting research that's been done by the Fuller Youth Institute. And they've found that there's three common answers to this question, where do I belong, when they interviewed young people. And while this was specifically with young people, I think it can actually relate to any person here in our church today. And I'd just like to give you a really brief summary of the things that they found. So these are responses to the question, where do I belong? I belong where I feel safe to be me. I belong where I feel comfortable, where people accept me and don't judge me, where I can be my real self, where I don't have to be fake. When I belong, it's not just about fitting in, it's actually about bringing my whole self to the table, all the parts, and not just the version that people want to see. And our homes and churches are meant to be safe spaces that provide belonging, but sadly, sadly that's not the case for some of us. And not belonging in our family, not belonging in our church can be one of the most painful things that we can experience. I belong where I feel safe. I belong where we share. I belong where we have shared experiences, where we share the same values and priorities, where we've worked on something together. When we've got similar interests, that's when I feel like I belong. And for many of us, we're constantly navigating multiple groups, multiple relationships simultaneously, which can actually lead to this constant shifting of who we are for different people. I wonder if anyone gets exhausted from that. I belong where we share. I belong where I feel like I'm needed. I wonder if anyone can relate to this one. I belong where I have to help out in some way, where there is a connection between belonging and a sense of resp responsibility, feeling like I have a job to do here. And belonging in this sense can be seeing ourselves as a really important part of the community that we're involved in. But there's a shadow side to this idea of belonging where we're needed because it can make belonging feel conditional, like we're never able to belong and just be ourselves. We always have to do, to do something, because to belong here, I've got to do something to feel important. And so one of the challenges in this current society, in the community that we can live in, is its temporary nature, because our lives are constantly in motion. And so we're constantly negotiating where we belong, and so for most of the time, it can be that I belong for now, just in this moment, in this season. And I wonder if anyone can relate to this. It actually doesn't matter of our age or stage in life. We all want a permanent sense of belonging that's not qualified on whether we feel like we've got something to contribute or whether we've shared a common experience. And in my journey, I've found that there's actually a better answer about where we find true belonging. 
We belong with God and we belong with his people. It sounds really simple, but it is the truth that I would love for us to truly understand today. We belong with God and we belong with his people. We were created for community. We were created for relationship. We actually don't have to earn our acceptance, our place in the body of Christ. That's not how it was ever meant to be. We belong to God and we actually belong to each other. We weren't created to do this journey alone. Those feelings of loneliness that we have, we weren't created to feel that way because we were meant to do this whole Christian life thing together. And this word with, it's powerful because it actually symbolizes the heart of God when it comes to his heart for his people to be near us, among us. In the Christmas story, we read about Emmanuel, Jesus, who came to be with us. He's with us no matter what, at all times, in all circumstances. And that is way better news than just feeling safe to be me. Safety is important. Please hear me on that. It's important to feel safe in relationships, but it can be fleeting. And so our truest sense of belonging actually comes from the unconditional love of God and his promise to be with us always. And so church family, I believe that in our current pandemic of loneliness and of disconnectedness, it's time to lean in to the power of with. There's something special in doing life together. And Jesus himself has given us examples of this. And just as we land our message this morning, I'd just like to take us through just a couple of passages of scripture. I'm going to share briefly the stories, and if you want to take a photo um, or write down these references, I encourage you to spend some time in them during the week. We're going to be looking at the book of John, so we're in the New Testament now, and chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 give us a beautiful picture of what it means to live in community. So I'm going to just share four values and principles this morning that might help us get a sense of who God's calling us to be. So the first one we have is in John 13, 1 to 15, and we celebrated communion last week. We had an agape feast together. And here we read in the book of John 13, 1 to 15, that we are friends who wash feet and share tables. That's what we see Jesus demonstrating. We see him washing his disciples' feet, and then he doesn't leave it there as just one isolated act. He actually tells his disciples to keep on doing this for one another. And so that invitation reaches right across the span of time to us today and says, friends, I want you to share a table with each other. I want you to wash one another's feet. I want you to love one another and to serve one another. And as we think about this idea of what it means to share tables together, to wash feet together, I invite you to think about some of these questions. And again, this is meant to, I guess, prompt you for some later reflection later, um, not to answer right now. So again, if you've got your phones and you want to take a photo, or if you're a notes girl or guy, you can write it down. But I wonder, have you shared a table with others before and felt connected in a meaningful way? But there's some moments that you can reflect on where you have felt connected. Who could you invite to share a table with? Who could you invite to have a coffee with? Who could you reach out to and connect with? And then how about this one? How could you wash someone's feet? Is there someone in your world that maybe perhaps God's inviting you to forgive or to restore a relationship where you've been hurt? This is what it means to be friends who wash feet and share tables. Number two, in John 13, 34 to 35, and this is a really well-known verse, and we may have read it before, and it's the new commandment Jesus gives to us to love one another just as I have loved you, and by this the world will know that you are my disciples. Jesus commanded his disciples to love one another, and he commands us, invites us to do the same. And church, I know this is hard to do at times, It's really hard to live out, but the best testimony that we can give of the power of the gospel, it's not by how much we know, but by how we love, by the love that we pour out on others. And so again, just a few reflection questions for you to think about for later. Has someone showed you love lately in an unexpected way? Is there a way that you could show unconditional love 
to someone in your world right now. And if you were to do that, what might you need to be intentional about? Life's busy, things are crazy. Is there something that you might need to do in order for this to happen? Number three, John 14. And this is a beautiful chapter that talks about our relationship with the triune God. We, believe, we belong with the triune God, the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit is in relationship with each other and we're invited into that space. It's incredible. We're promised to have a comforter that is with us always. We're promised that we're never, ever alone, that God is with us at every single point in our journey. And so I wonder as you reflect on this beautiful invitation to be in relationship with the Trinity, with the triune God, is there a moment where you've experienced God recently? Is there a time where you have seen him at work in your life, where you have felt his presence, his comfort, his care? I wonder, are there some circumstances in your life right now where you need to be reminded that you're not alone in this, that God's with you, that he's going to carry you through, that you can look to him even when it feels uncertain? And I wonder if you're not really sure of those answers to that question, if you're thinking, you know what, I don't even think I've got space for God in my life at the moment. I wonder, could this be an invitation for you to make space for him? Is there a new practice or a new rhythm that you could adopt in your journey so that you can spend time with your creator and be reminded that you are not alone? You know, even when the earthly community of the church fails us, we can hold on to the promise that God's spirit's with us always. Even when humans fail us, we can hold on to that. But the fact is, Jesus actually has a bigger plan, a bigger dream for our church. He actually wants more for us. And in our fourth principle here, John 17, it talks about the fact that we belong with one another as the church. This is how it was meant to be, together, in community. And as Jesus prays in John 17, he actually looks to the future. He looks to you and me sitting here today, and he extends an invitation for us to be together as one body. And I love this quote by German writer Albert Schweitzer, and he says, in everyone's life, at some point, our inner fire goes out, and it's then burst into flame by an encounter with another human being. We should all be thankful for those people who rekindle our inner spirit. It's not a beautiful analogy, that bursting of flame, that encouragement that we can receive just from being in the presence of one another. And so as you reflect on this this morning, I wonder, is there someone that's encouraged you? Is there someone that has rekindled your inner flame? Church, who are your people? Do you have meaningful connection in your life that helps you to stay healthy, thriving, or is this an area that you're struggling in? If you can't find a space where you can experience belonging, I wonder, is there a way that maybe you could help to create this for someone else? And I wonder as we think about this, is there someone that God might put on your heart this week that you could encourage, that you could reach out to, that may be feeling alone and need someone to connect with them? True belonging and connection happens when we stop just trying to fit in and we realise that we're meant to do life with God and with each other. And there's not one part of our journey that we're meant to do alone. We're meant to do all of it together, eating, sharing together, the good times, the bad times. And we see that in the Acts 2 community. We see a beautiful picture of what it looks like to be the church. It's an amazing picture when you read through in Acts chapter 2. But the fact is, as beautiful as this picture of human community is, we know that human connections aren't perfect, right? We can all think of those challenges that we face with in life. And so to be in community is to live in this tension between the challenge of human community, but also the beauty of what comes out of that. And I've actually experienced my truest sense of belonging when I have been part of an intentional small group or a life group. And I wonder if anyone here has experienced that kind of community. When I think back in my journey and what that felt like, I just remember Wednesday nights we'd meet. It was around that time that I shared earlier when I was feeling really lonely. 
And this group became my family. And there's a few familiar faces here. We'd journey together, we'd do life together. We were such an eclectic group. Like, we actually didn't have a lot in common. Um, but when we came together, it didn't matter. We were from different ages and stages. I think we had a new baby in the mix. And we'd get together on a Wednesday and share food and share life together. It was a spirit-filled space, and I just loved spending time. I felt at home. I felt like I belonged with them. And then eventually that group actually multiplied and a few new groups were birthed out of this group. And now I'm a part of another group um, that we meet with regularly. And this group also has provided a sense of home for me, some more familiar faces there, a sense of belonging. And so doing life together as part of an intentional community, whether it is a life group or a Sabbath school class. I know there's some Sabbath school classes here at Springwood that are very intentional about your time together. Maybe it's just two or three of you coming together to spend that time. All of this can be an experience of being the church. But you know what? That living in the two realities, our imperfection, and the high calling of community that God invites us into, it takes courage and commitment and vulnerability. And as we close today, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge me. I want to invite you to experience the community that God has intended for each of us. Because in these uncertain times that we live, we can't afford to not do it together. We can't do it by ourselves. It's core to who we are as a church, and I'm committed to growing in this space and for us to do it together. And I wonder if there's anyone here that would like to be a part of a small group or a life group or wants to know, how do I even start? I want this thing that you've just described, but like, I don't even know how to get that thing started. I don't ride a bike like Pastor Russ does and have a cycling group. I'm not part of a craft club or I'm not sure if I'm ready for a big in-depth Bible study. It doesn't matter. There are so many different ways that we can connect. And myself, Pastor Ray, Pastor Paul, Warren Somerville, I know he's here today, Warren. Um, He's part of our life group, um, Leaders Ministry. If you'd like to connect in this area, I invite you to come and talk to one of us because we want to help you be connected. And so my challenge for today is this. Springwood family, in the chaos around us, the messy rooms, the messy lives, the messy stuff that we're going through, let us remain tethered. Let us be anchored in who we are in God and who he's called us to be together. And let's remember that king with a really long name, Jehoshaphat. Let's remember what he did when he was in uncertain times. He didn't look ahead to this glorious vision, he looked to God. And that's the invitation that each of us have today, to be with God and to be with each other. Let's pray together this morning. And I wonder, I wonder if you'd like to stand with me, just as a sense of uh, us being together in this. And you kind of look around to your right and to your left. Maybe there's a stranger next to you today. Um, Hopefully they won't be a stranger for very long, because you might say hello to them afterwards. But we're called to be a family, and I'm privileged to be part of this family with you. Um, Martin and I are so excited to be back here, and we look forward to getting to know each of you better. And it's our heartfelt prayer that you will experience the community that you long for here as a family at Springwood. So if you're comfy, you can put a hand on the shoulder. If you'd prefer to um, yeah, just close your eyes in prayer, you're welcome to do that also. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you have this grand design of community that you've created us to be a part of. And Lord, we mess it up so many times. We fail each other, we disappoint each other, we leave each other out. But that's not how it's meant to be. And today you're inviting us once again to connect with you, to create space for you in our lives, and to create space for other people. So I pray that you would be with every person here, For those that are really lonely right now, Lord, I pray that you would come and fill their hearts and that you would bring a a friend, a person into their lives that can encourage them. For those of us that are super well-connected, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to the people around us, someone who might need a lunch invite, someone who might need a conversation or a call during the week. Jesus, I thank you for this gift of community that you've given us.
I pray that you would help us as we journey together as a family here at Springwood. And we ask all of these things in your mighty name. And everyone said together, amen, amen.